Hi, this is Tim Davis from BitGlass. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, why does anybody need a Cloud Access Security Broker, or CASB? And there's really four problems that CASBs are trying to solve. The first one is that because we don't live in the world you see pictured in front of you anymore, where data and applications resided in a private cloud data center that was on a campus or on-premise or uh, possibly in a co-location facility, where those data and applications sat behind this stack of security solutions that gave uh, corporate IT staff and security staff visibility, uh, access control, um, data loss prevention, threat protection, and rich logging into how that data was being accessed and what that data was being used for as users accessed it. Th this world doesn't really exist anymore. And the, world, the reason it doesn't exist is because of cloud. First of all, there are SaaS applications like uh, Office 365, G Suite, Workday, Salesforce that, as have, that have been adopted by enterprises. And as such, the data has moved out of that private cloud data center um, into these cloud applications. And not only has the data moved, but the users have moved as well because we live in a mobile world and uh, users want to access their data and applications and be productive from places outside of the office in many cases, whether their job requires them to specifically travel or not. The consequence of this, of course, is that cloud and mobile means your data and your users live beyond the data center and the campus, leaving on-premise security technologies out of the path. So when we move to cloud, we've lost that visibility, logging, access control, DLP, and threat protection that we had when we had applications living in a private cloud data center and users, for the most part, living on campus. But that's not the only problem that CASBs are trying to solve. Because what happened in this cloud revolution is once people discovered how easy it was for them to access those cloud applications from their corporate issue devices, they started wanting to use their own devices as well. So this is the BYO movement, whether that's uh, your, your phone or your tablet or your personal computer. Um, as you're traveling, maybe you want to log in and check email from a, uh, you know, the, the computer in the lobby of a hotel or something like that, right? Um, and cloud enables you to do those types of things um, because the access isn't dependent on being behind uh, a corporate perimeter or uh, even having a VPN connection. Uh, so it only takes a username and a password to download data to any device. And that's a good thing from productivity perspective, but it's a scary thing from an, a data security perspective because now that data that lives in those sanctioned applications can potentially be downloaded to devices that uh, corporate IT has no control over. And so that now that data is, is out in the wild and, um, and there's no visibility into what's happening to it. So that's the second problem that CASBs are trying to solve. The third one is that there are lots of cloud applications out there beyond the ones that uh, corporate IT has decided for their uh, organizations to use. Um, those are called unsanctioned cloud applications, and they can be good applications. Sometimes they're even the same thing. It might be personal Office 365 as opposed to the corporate Office 365. Um, it might be file sharing sites. It might be social media sites. Those are all not necessarily bad applications, but they're applications where uh, corporate IT doesn't want their data to reside because they either aren't using those um, in a sanctioned way where they get visibility and control over those applications and the ability to uh, you know, scan the data that's in there, um, or uh, there may be applications that aren't as secure and pose a greater risk to that organization. But reality is if a user can put data into a sanctioned cloud application, potentially they can put that data into any cloud application. And this is primarily users doing things from their managed devices uh, when they're outside of the corporate IT perimeter, uh, outside of the corporate firewall, traveling or uh, working from another location. And then there's a fourth problem, and maybe this one is the most obvious, um, and that is the, uh, the idea of the malicious user, right? In, in the old days, malicious users had to get through a stack of security solutions without being detected. Uh, they had to penetrate them, first of all, and then they had to, to uh, do that without being detected in order to get at company data. But just like the benefits of cloud for uh, mobility and ease of access apply to uh, users with good intentions, that also applies to users with bad intentions. 
Uh, the ease of access applies to malicious users too. Now they can go directly to these cloud applications if they're able to fish credentials. Um, sometimes it only takes that username and password and that's it. And now they've got access to uh, all sorts of data that lives out there in the cloud. And it can be very difficult for corporate security and IT teams to get visibility uh, into even uh, you know, that happening and the much less control over and uh, prevention of those malicious users doing those things. And I'd add that it could be malicious users who are external to the organization or it could be malicious users that are internal to the organization. So to quickly recap, cloud and mobile means your data and your users live beyond your data center and campus, leaving on-premise security technologies out of the path. It only takes a username and a password to download data to any device, be that a managed device or an unmanaged device from a corporate perspective. If a user can put data into a sanctioned cloud application, then that data can potentially go to any cloud application, even ones that you don't want it into. And then finally, that ease of access that cloud brings applies just as much to malicious users as it does to uh, your internal good intentioned users as well. So those are the four problems that CASBs are trying to solve. Uh, and then next time we'll address how CASBs attempt to solve those problems and what the strengths and weaknesses of each of those methods are. Thanks for listening.